Um, right, good morning everybody. Um, so, my part now is to talk about the construction of the luminaire. So we've heard from Roger about the importance of the light source, we've heard from Graham about how important the driver is and all the factors that we've got to think about. We've just heard from Les about the optics. And now I want to kind of bring it all together really in the construction of the luminaire. And I guess really like Graham alluded to, my worry is that we think or we focus far too much on the LED. What do we think about when we specify a product or we are um, wanting to use an LED product? Well, I think the first thing we always think about is price, isn't it? That's the first one. Then we might think about, well, how good is its luminaire lumens per circuit watt? And then how much light it produces? But when do we actually think about the quality of the construction, the materials used in the construction, how well it's been put together? Is it fit for the purpose? Is it fit for the application that it's going into? And I worry that we focus a lot on the life of the LED, what the LED is doing, how efficient it is, but actually forget about the importance of the rest of the luminaire. It's a bit like going and buying a car and worrying about the engine lasting 100,000 miles, but then not really worrying about the gearbox or the clutch or the suspension or the wheels or the electric windows. <laughs> but any failure on one of those parts could potentially render the car uh, useless. And it's the same with an LED product. What about the lenses? Well, Les has talked about the function of the lenses, but what about what they're made from? If they're made from polycarbonate, has the manufacturer used UV stabilized polycarbonate, for example, to stop it going brown or brittle and cracking through life? What about the thermal management of the luminaire, the ingress protection, the mechanical strength of the luminaire, and as I've already alluded, UV protection? All of these other things are very important points. So I want to talk about some of the external factors that can influence um, a light fitting and I haven't got enough time to talk about all of them so I want to focus on three elements heat water and impacts <coughs> so let's start with heat then heat is the Achilles heel to light fittings and not just LED fittings any light fitting to be honest with you and heat can directly affect the life of the product the reliability its appearance and also its performance. And understanding the ambient temperature that the product is going into, particularly with LED technology, is vitally important, as you'll see over the next few slides. But three of the most heat critically affected components are the LEDs, the driver, and if it's an emergency product, the batteries that are contained within the fitting. Batteries really don't like heat at all, as most of you probably know. But let's start with the driver. So most electronic drivers have a lifetime of approximately 50,000 hours, providing that the manufacturer isn't doing something stupid inside the light fitting. However, if I should go back a stage actually. That's providing that lifetime there of 50,000 hours, let's say for example, is a typical ambient of 25 degrees C. Most manufacturers will rate a lifetime of their product at a particular ambient temperature. And it's important that we talk to the luminaire manufacturer about what the ambient temperature is in relation to their rated lifetimes. Again, as you see as I go forwards. But let's say for argument's sake, 50,000 hours at 25 degrees C ambient. If, however, you increase that ambient temperature by just 10 degrees, so that's now a 35 degree ambient temperature, then all of a sudden you halve that driver life. You halve it. 50,000 hours now goes to 25,000 hours. But interestingly, if you decrease it by 10 degrees, you double it. You double the life of the driver. So the ambient temperature and the conditions that that driver is operating in is absolutely critical. So we all look at these lifetimes, Graham saying 50,000 hours L70B10. Again, that might just be for the LED. What about the driver? 
Let's talk about the LEDs for a second then. So the amount of light that the LEDs produce initially and how quickly they degradate is all based upon heat. So I've got a very typical graph here of the um, lumen reduction, or should I say the effect of heat on an LED. So you can see there uh, the junction temperature of the LED. So this is the operating temperature of the LED. And you can see the amount of light that it's producing up the side there. And no surprises for guessing, the hotter it gets, the less light the LED produces. But again, it's making this connection between the junction temperature and the ambient temperature that's in the environment. So let's say, for example, at uh, a 25 degrees C ambient in a particular product, this equates to a junction temperature of 55 degrees C. And that will totally depend on how the manufacturer is driving that LED and also the amount of um, thermal management the manufacturer has applied to that fitting. But let's say for argument's sake, we've got a product at 25 degrees C, the junction temperature is 55 degrees C. And what you can see there instantly is you've lost 5% of the light from the LED. So you're down by 5% to start with straight away. Let's say, for example, we now put that light fitting in a higher ambient temperature. So if we increase the ambient temperature, what happens to the junction temperature? Goes up as well, of course. So let's say we now put this LED product into a 55 degree ambient environment. Well now, all of a sudden, your junction temperature is up at 85 degrees C and you've lost another 5%. Now, this is just typical and there could be situations where the amount that you lose is less than this or more than this, depending on the product and the application. This just gives a typical guidance. But by putting that light fitting in a 55 degree ambient temperature, then you've lost 10% of the light output from that light fitting straight away. But you might say to me, well, hang on a minute, 55 degrees is a bit warm, isn't it? Well, it might not be. OK, we're not exactly in Dubai, but if you look at many industrial warehouses or factories, uh, factory type applications, then it's 25 degrees C or 20 degrees down here. But up there, it gets a lot hotter. And as you try and heat those large spaces, then the heat um, collects at the top of the space, typically where the light fitting is installed. And you can quite easily have ambient temperatures much, much higher than where people are working. And therefore, that light fitting is actually working in a much higher ambient temperature. So that deals with the effects of initial light output, but we also have to consider um, the degradation over time as well. And what we can see from this graph is that, again, the hotter that LED is, the quicker the light degradates from that fixture. So let's take an arbitrary 70,000 hours there. And what we can see is that at 85 degrees C, we will have lost 20% of the light output from that product. Whereas if we maintain 55 degrees C, then actually we only lose 10% of the light output from that product. So the ambient temperature, as you can see, has a direct effect on the amount of light that the product produces in the first place and also how quickly the light output deteriorates as the product goes through its life. So do talk to the manufacturer about the ambient temperature in the environment because you might find that that product performs very differently in its application to what you might think it does just from a simple data sheet. And when you're looking at lifetime values from a manufacturer, also look at what ambient temperature they're rating it at as well, just to be absolutely sure what you're looking at. But there are other effects of heat as well. Some of the things I can't really go into a lot of detail on, but heat can affect um, the diffuser and optical materials can cause it to discolour, which of course reduces light output. It can also cause discoloration to the paintwork, which again can affect the light output or the visual appearance of the light fitting. It can also call, cause, the peel to, blah, blah, cause the paint to peel um, uh, as well, which again obviously doesn't look very good. Uh, there's also something called discoloration of the solder mask. Um, 
Many of you that have seen an LED fitting, hopefully you've all seen an LED fitting, that's a daft thing to say, isn't it? Um, <laughs> but uh, many of you will have noticed that on an LED PCB, you have a white coating where the LEDs are placed, well, that's called the solder mask. And quite often in a lot of products, um, that white coating is actually used as an internal reflector to bounce the light back forwards again and out through the diffuser. And again, uh, high ambient temperatures can cause that solder mask to discolor, to go brown, and then effectively you, you lose that uh, reflective surface. Um, I think as Roger alluded to in his presentation, then again, higher ambient temperatures can cause the LEDs to have significant color shift as well, or to shift uh, more than you would expect, and therefore have products that have different color temperatures. And you can even have something right down to very complex issues, such as outgassing from solvents and gaskets. So again, in a lot of LED products, we use gaskets to seal the luminaire or we use solvents. And high ambient temperatures can cause those materials to give off a gas, which can actually be detrimental to the LED and can cause it to corrode and cause it to fail. So there are all sorts of complex issues that can be surrounded, just something as simple as heat and higher ambient temperatures. So as I say, do talk to the manufacturer if you know that the product is going into a high ambient temperature. Let's talk about water then. As we all know, water and electricity don't tend to mix too well. And selecting a luminaire with the appropriate IP rating is actually quite important. And I know this is going back to basics a little bit, but sometimes I feel we need to go back to basics and just remind ourselves of why we do things and some of the processes that we should be going through. An IP rating is actually very important. IP stands for ingress protection, and it helps define the effectiveness of electrical enclosures against the intrusion of foreign bodies, such as dust and water, for example. And we have this numbering system. So after the IP uh, lettering, we then have two numbers. The first number deals with solid objects, and we have a numbering system from one to six. So one there deals with solid objects greater than 50 millimeters. Uh, two is 12 and a half millimeters, the equivalent to a typical human finger, all the way up to six, which is dust tight, um, no ingress of dust at all. We then have moisture or water. And again, we have a rating. Typically, we, we know the ratings from one to eight, but there is actually something called 9K. Has anyone come across 9K before? No, that's interesting. So this actually comes from a German DIN standard, and I've included that in there just because it's popped up at a few other uh, light bite sessions over the year. And this specifically relates to high pressure, high temperature uh, clean downs, basically. So I think it's 85 degrees C temperature at a particular bar pressure, um, so the luminaire can be... Um, clean down, typically used in food manufacturing or abattoirs or um, applications like that. But typically we know the one to eight uh, system, um, which then defines the amount of water that is um, being subjected to the light fitting and also the amount that is allowed to um, penetrate the light fitting. And of course we commonly know an exterior luminaire as IP65, well that's what we often look to specify in an outdoor um, application. So what we're saying there is that it's dust tight and from a water perspective, then it's protected against jets of water with limited ingress permitted. So I just thought, um, I'm aware there are some other manufacturers in the room, but there's a lot that aren't. And I just thought I'd show a very quick video clip. Can you hear that? So all year I've had no sound with that clip at all. <laughs> and then this one is at DEF CON 11. Anyway, that's a, an IP65 test, just to give you an idea of how we, um, how we test. 
uh, from a water perspective. So you could see there that the luminaire was rotating. So it's very important that the water jets obviously um, impact the fitting at different angles so we can get it on the seals, um, et cetera, et cetera. So let's just talk about uh, impacts then. Again, impacts are very um, important, not uh, just for the obvious applications such as um, vandal uh, resistant luminaires, you know, prison cells, custodial cells, um, uh, and so on, but in lots of everyday applications as well. Um, uh, you know, typically exterior uh, lighting can often um, uh, be subject to uh, abuse and vandalism and so on. So we have a, a system that allows us to understand the strength of the luminaire so we can hopefully um, you know, ward off those, those issues. So the IK rating system helps classify the level of impact protection of electrical enclosures. And again, it's a number rated system. So the standards go from one to 10 plus plus. And this defines the weight of the object that impacts the fitting. Um, and we drop that weight from a different distance, uh, which then equates uh, essentially to a, a scale of energy that's being exerted against the product. And you can see that in the brackets there with the joules. So slowly that uh, goes up and up until the maximum uh, force is 50 joules at 10 plus plus. And of course, we commonly associate IK10 as being a pretty robust um, luminaire. But is IK10 plus plus enough? Yeah, let's get the sledgehammer on it. I just like showing that video. <laughs> um, now, I'm not suggesting that your average person walks around with a sledgehammer in his pocket, but sometimes there are instances where IK10++ isn't enough, and we do need to go beyond that. And some manufacturers do go beyond that. And this is the reason why I wanted to stress this, really, is that we are starting to see manufacturers using IK ratings beyond 10++. But I must stress that the standard stops at 10 plus plus. There is no standard that goes beyond that. So what some manufacturers are doing are interpolating the standard to go beyond that, which is absolutely fine. But of course, it isn't a standard. But I guess the thing to point out is that one manufacturer's IK18 isn't necessarily the same as another manufacturer's IK18. So if you are looking at those specifications and you're comparing them, just be aware that the standard does stop at 10 plus plus and maybe talk to the manufacturer a bit more as to how they've extrapolated that data, particularly if you're comparing products. But as I say, there are instances sometimes where we do need to go above and beyond what's defined in standards. So in conclusion then of uh, what I've discussed so far, heat, good thermal management and layout of components is absolutely critical um, in LED products, less so these days than it was in the early days because the ambient, not the ambient, the um, internal temperature of LED products have come down a long way. Many of you remember the first LED products that came into the marketplace with huge, great big aluminium heat sinks on the back of them because we were driving the knackers off the LEDs just to try and get a decent light output out of them. And of course, today we don't need to do that, but we still need good mindfulness of how we place the components inside the light fitting. And I always remember opening up a competitor's light fitting to see that they placed the driver directly on the back of the heat sink which isn't always a wise place to put it. So good layout of components is very important to get a good lifetime. Do talk to the manufacturer about ambient temperature, as I've already stressed. Ambient temperature can have a huge effect on the lifetime rating and the lumen degradation of the product, particularly as you go into ambient temperatures of 40, 50, 60 and 70 degrees C. 
and also consider the quality of the components, the quality of the materials that are being used. You know, um, Graham was talking about, you know, warranties of 20 years, et cetera, et cetera. But have the, has the uh, materials been used and has the design uh, been uh, sufficient to, uh, to last that lifetime? Uh, we do need to give that uh, due diligence consideration as well. From a water perspective, then in an application, we need to consider the likely risk and impact from moisture. Are the luminaires likely to be subject uh, to water? If so, we need to select the relevant IP. And to a certain degree, we shouldn't over IP. I quite often see specifications where it's sort of a bit belt and braces, where it doesn't necessarily need to be, which can actually be at the detriment to the product and detriment to the solution in the environment. So again, it's a sensible decision that needs to be made. But as ever with IP rated luminaires, a lot of the time it comes down to the quality of the installation, not necessarily the quality of the product. Um, are there any contractors in the room? If there are, you're probably not going to admit it. Um, but um, quality of installation, yeah, I mean, you know, I've seen sites where, um, you know, the, 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 the cables into the luminaire have been sealed and glanded correctly, but then the luminaire has been mounted by drilling the back of the body and a wood screw going through the body. You know, clearly you're not going to maintain your IP65 in that kind of application. So it does come down to good installation as well. In terms of impacts then, um, consider the risk and likelihood of impact to the luminaire uh, and uh, you know, a bit of a risk assessment needs to be undertaken. Uh, we need to consider the materials that are used. Quite often we don't need an IK rated fitting but just something simple like well maybe the use of a polycarbonate diffuser would be better than the use of an acrylic diffuser for example um, just to stave off um, any issues. And then if, you know, serious vandalism is likely, then we do need to consider an IK rating system or an IK rating for the product uh, and making sure it's fit and uh, suitable for the application. And that is me. You're going to call us all up. <laughs>